my community activity. Community activity and public service is a very strong value that I have held and lived by my whole life. In addition to working on gun violence reduction, I've served on the San Francisco Police Commission, and I've also served on the San Francisco Ethics Commission, and as president of the San Francisco Women Lawyers Alliance. While on the San Francisco Ethics Commission, while I was president, we got past partial public financing to rein in some of the expenses for running for office in San Francisco. When I was on the San Francisco uh, Women's Alliance Board, when I was serving as president, we created and got installed into the Hall of Justice a children's waiting room because we felt passionately that children shouldn't be in criminal courtrooms listening to the business of their parents. And likewise, the, now there's another children's waiting room that the Alliance brought about down in the City Hall uh, courtrooms, and that's available to jurors as well as to parties. So here again, it's a service that for the community who has business in the courts. <coughs> My qualifications for a judge. I have been really growing into this job all of my life and most recently in the past 30 years. I have over 30 years as a law professional and there are three things about my experience that is particularly notable and unique. Of those 30 years, 20 of those years are working as an advocate, representing clients and their needs, advocating for their needs. The second thing that is important to understand is that the breadth of my practice, I have both criminal and civil law experience, but the bulk of my experience is in that civil area, and I have experience on a large cross-section of legal matters, including contracts and business and partnerships, employment, real estate, construction, trusts and estates, and, and so on. And the third, and probably, especially the most important, I believe, is that for the last 10 years, my work as a mediator and arbitrator and a hearing officer with the San Francisco Police Commission has allowed me to use the very skills that a judge needs in the courtroom. Listening carefully what the parties have to say, evaluating the evidence, weighing the evidence, helping parties resolve their conflicts, making tough decisions. Example of tough decisions, the police misconduct cases. Part of the job as a police commissioner is to be the hearing officer on serious police misconduct cases. And then also to decide on guilt and penalty on those cases. This is a very tough job to do. So I have experience making these tough decisions. So I would bring to the court and would like to have the honor to bring to the court my personal experience as a victim of a very serious violent crime, the experience of being a single mom to a young boy for his whole life, a business owner as the owner of my mediation services, I know what it's like to be a business owner. In small law firms, I know what it's like to be responsible for the well-being of employees and training them and for client matters and running a business. I know what that's like, my community service, the integrity of my working on my values and bringing that into the community and public service. And then finally, 30 years of experience in the legal profession, both as an advocate but also as somebody who is working as a decision maker. 
and I think that that is a, an especially important feature in a judge and an, an important uh, experience that I would like to have the privilege to bring to the court. I can promise you this, as a judge, every party that appears before me will be treated with respect, will be treated fairly and justly, regardless of who they are, what their background is, what they look like, or their socioeconomic status. I thank you for listening, and most importantly, I'm anxious to hear from you what you perceive the needs are in your community and how the judicial system, how our courts in San Francisco can help you and what you think they could do to provide better services to you. I know one thing, on the bench, I would be working very, very hard as demonstrated by my work history and I would be able to work very, very efficiently because I have 10 years of experience working in a quasi-judicial capacity. So again, thank you very much. My endorsements, partial endorsements, are listed on the page here. Um, I think it's more important that we go directly into your questions, so I don't want to take up any more. Thank you. We're really lucky to have uh, two really dynamic, hardworking, caring, and qualified uh, candidates with us. So next 10 minutes or so, take some questions from you guys. Um, what do you think about harm reduction? Sorry, did you say harm, harm reduction? reduction? Harm reduction. Harm reduction. What do you think about harm reduction? I'm sorry, you have a little bit of harm reduction. Harm reduction is harm reduction. Harm Some people do better um, having their own program of reducing self-inflicted harm uh, by substance abuse. Uh, I personally found it very effective with uh, people that I've worked with. Um, I, I don't, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what, how that would play into my role as a judge. Um, but in terms of uh, a member of the community, I, I've definitely seen some people uh, who would not have been capable at first to completely abstain. Uh, to kind of find their own way. Uh, and I think it's particularly important, having been a group home counselor, for example, um, to be able to not turn your back on someone simply because they don't follow the same path that you would. I firmly believe that we are an evolving uh, culture in terms of how to help people in their what works, what, what, what works for one person doesn't work for everybody. <clears throat> the most important thing is that it does work for the person that is using it. And so I think that sitting on the bench, how that translates is the framework of the law, which we are constrained by um, as, as judges. So within the framework of the law, how does that fit for that individual person and their matter in court? But I think the type of compassion that you're perhaps raising in your question is an important matter on the court. We need people on the bench that will listen to what will work for a person who can have compassion. Okay. Hi, David Elliott Lewis. In addition to being a mass photographer, I'm also co-chair of the Mental Health Board of San Francisco. So this question is about the role of mental health in sentencing, and, uh, and I understand you have to follow the law. But when you have a case, a criminal case, 
where mental illness has played a factor in the criminal behavior, and let's say you could not convert that person to behavior at health court, that was not an option for whatever reason, and so that the case is before you to decide, uh, and there's guilt, or maybe this assumption of guilt. What is your thinking about how to, how to resolve, what are your values about that when it comes to sentencing, when it comes to applying the law, when there is a strong mental illness factor, contributing factor to the bad behavior? How do you? Mr. Weiss, you are raising. David Lewis. Oh, Lewis. 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 I'm sorry, I just, I just heard your name. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. You're raising an incredibly um, important and difficult question. Our country has been struggling with what to do with people with mental illness its entire history. And as you know, you know, a lot of people historically that would have a place to go don't have a place to go today uh, because our structures have, have gotten rid of, of, of places that they would have gone before. This is a matter that the police commission has grappled with dealing with mental illness on the street in terms of law enforcement. And there, the officers are now being trained on how to be uh, sensitive to people with mental illness and how to appropriately handle situations where somebody is clearly suffering from a mental illness. Now they get into the court system, they've been charged, they're arrested. Again, you're right in pointing out that as a judge, we have these parameters around what to do when, when a person is charged. Yet, we need to listen to all of the evidence as well. And that, you're bringing in an important factor that a judge needs to take into consideration. And he or she will hopefully have um, strong advocates uh, representing them. Uh, and, and this, and, and indicating you know, the state of mind they are in, because that is very relevant in terms of their uh, culpability in certain um, criminal charges, as you know. Uh, but I think that the judicial system in general needs to do more work in this area. I think that both the legislative arm as well as the courts need to work more around sensing, sensing guidelines, and permitting judges to have more uh, leeway in terms of sentencing. Is that okay? Uh, yes. <coughs> Thanks for the question. I uh, I, I would just add to what Ms. Kingsley said uh, as well. Is that as a practitioner. Um, now as a candidate, I'm, I'm the only candidate that has been in that situation as a criminal defense lawyer advocating specifically what my client's mental health issues are and how that has to play a factor into sentencing. Um, and uh, it has been uh, quite nice when judges were willing to consider these factors and, and look to not only see how that factor can play into the sentencing now, but how the sentencing structure itself can be a rehabilitative one, one that integrates back into society to not only look at what happened in the past, but prevent things from happening in the future. Uh, so I'm quite keen on those particular issues. Um, I, I have fought very hard uh, in many cases to make that be something that is a factor uh, for sentencing uh, purposes. And I would continue to do so, uh, if I like. Yeah, First, I want to thank two of you for presenting tonight. Um, as a retired lawyer, I can tell you that it's almost unprecedented that judges engage the community where they sit. So I, I thank you for that. My, my concern um, with the Superior Court in San Francisco today is the filing fees. It seems that the filing fees are, are, are so, so great. They deny access to many low-income people. Um, I know you have a fee waiver for uh, defendants in unlawful detainer actions um, if they qualify income-wise, but you really don't have that mechanism for civil litigation where a low-income person wants to pursue a claim. Your filing fee in municipal court today, I believe, is three hundred and seventy dollars. Most many 
if not all low-income people, particularly in this district, can afford three hundred and seventy dollars for a filing fee. So you're denying them access to justice. Um, what are what are, you, what are your positions on, on, on that particular issue? I've, either one. Okay. Uh, I, I personally see that obstacle be something that can't be overcome uh, uh, for, for many people. Uh, the filing fees, not only the filing fees, but to participate in civil litigation, as you know, there are many other fees. The cost of the deposition is a thousand dollars a pot. Right? Exactly. Uh, so uh, it, it, it makes it very difficult uh, to do that. Um, it, from from a judicial standpoint, some of the things we see, I just uh, I consulted with a friend of mine who just got evicted from his place in Burma. Uh, and in that capacity, you're looking at not only do you have the problem of the cost, but it's also kind of what is at the end of the rainbow, so to speak. Is it a one-hour hearing in front of the bench? Uh, because a one-hour hearing, wh where, where do you even have the time to fit in uh, all the discovery that you learned in that process? Um, and, and here today with, with me is my legal assistant, uh, Paulina, uh, who's had to serve as an interpreter for our clients because the courts don't have interpreters. The budget doesn't provide for uh, Spanish-speaking interpreters or any other foreign language interpreters in restraining order cases. So it's considered an optional thing. I can tell you from my clients who were seeking protection, it wasn't optional at all. You know, but they, they needed to have someone do it, and if someone was undocumented and did not want to come into court for fear of some type of retaliation, um, it, 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 it made it very tough. So um, it, I think your point of the filing fees is, is one element of this bigger budget uh, crisis, but we have very efficient uh, examples of efficient systems, like the federal system is much more efficient uh, in, in many different ways, where people don't have to come back to court that often. There's less uh, uh, things that fall through the cracks, and I think uh, the people who are hit the hardest are the poor uh, when trying to get into the court system, um, because every impact is felt at least 10, 20 times as hard as someone who has a financial uh, kind of stability to deal with it. Um, Part of being a judge and, and, and part of what I look forward to uh, if I'm elected is being part of that board of judges that meet every month and talk about policy decisions. So that's where you can say, no, no, that's, that's not right. I've represented someone in this situation before. Uh, and I can tell you that this is what this individual may be going through, and this is why our system can be more efficient in addressing those needs. Uh, Ms. Kingsley, then we have one more question before we move on. Yeah. Um, so I said, Ms. Kingsley, yeah. then. Uh, my question, Hold on. Hold on. Um, one more, oh, I'm sorry. more response to, sorry. The, to the town's question. Thank you for your patience, sir. Um, I, I, I fully agree with the things that Mr. Flores says. Uh, I, I, it, it's a very difficult um, situation, and the administrative end of the courts need to be addressing that to be working on that. And I can tell you that I would be working on that in addition to many other aspects of the court to help us run as efficiently as possible. And one of them would be bringing uh, alternative dispute resolution into the court so that perhaps people that can't afford to go through the uh, trials with judges, or excuse me, with you know, attorneys representing them because there's the expense of the filing fee, but it pales in comparison to the lawyer's fees per hour, which is usually situational, or even uh, the, the uh, percentage fees, any fees in comparison to, to, to the filing fees. So there's, there's this whole problem, but there also is this tremendous resource in the community of people that are trained in the same skills as a lawyer. I help train them. And these people are very um, generous with their time in helping people in the community work out and resolve their conflicts. So I think that this is something that the courts can tap into this resource and make it available to the community. And then I guess the other thing is we also, on smaller cases, with 10,000 and below you know, in civil matters. There is the small claims court. Even that has a significant filing fee, but it isn't as high 
and without the expense of lawyers. 